Hi, we are going to be starting very soon. Please sit down. Please get seated so that we can get started. Bring your friends in. Tell them to come. Yeah. Uh, 
ตอนนี้เรามีสี่ครับผมเดี๋ยวเขาเรียกเองโอเค We are going to start uh, as we are running a little bit late, guys. So welcome back. Uh, I hope you guys had some valuable discussions in your last par parallel sessions. If I may have quiet from the room, please. Okay. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Rajesh Daniel, the head of communication for SCI Asia, and Dr. Kanakwam Manoram from Uban Ratchatani University. They will lead our discussions on the results of the four parallel sessions. Mr. Daniel and Dr. Manoram, please come to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you so much. Meaning you already here in the room. My name is Kanokwan Manorom from Varjatani University. I'm going to co-organize or co-facilitate the session with Rajesh. So over to you first, Rajesh. Thank you, Ashan Kanokwan. My name is Rajesh. I'm comms lead for Asia Asia. Probably seen me running around the room. And I am your co-moderator for today. Yeah, thank you, Rajesh. Before we get started, I think we have quite limited time, right? We have four groups together. Uh, we would like to, before we get started, why don't we say something about what we are doing, the format? Okay. A little bit about the format, and yes, we are slightly <laughs> delayed, uh, not too much, by conference standards. Uh, I'll tell you about the format, and uh, few housekeeping rules. The format is that there are four groups, they're going to present, and we didn't want them presenting all at once in a row, and you know, yeah. people are tired. So we're going to do it group at a time. Each group takes... 10 minutes. 10 minutes for yes. each group. Yes, sharp, right? Very sharp. Very sharp, yeah. Exactly, uh, because time is tight. And after all the four groups are done with their 10 minutes, uh, we will have an overall discussion as well. Hmm. Each group also gets to ask, be asked questions from the floor. And a bit of housekeeping. Uh, we do request, of course, all of you to be very concise, very precise. Uh, no case studies, no project descriptions. Why? Because time is tight. Not only time is tight. Why? Why we can't say about case studies? Because it takes time. Take time. Okay. <laughs> oh, you can't hear us? Yeah, I'm sorry. your microphone. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So uh, we request you to limit case studies or no case studies? Uh, probably, perhaps, be flexible, maybe one or two case studies, but two case studies. less than two minutes. If you have to say about your case study, if it, you consider it is so important, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know yourself, why right? is it important or not? <laughs> Excellent. Yes. And the second note is, uh, translation is available in the Mekong languages. If any of you feel uncomfortable with English or not fluent with English, please do talk in any of the four Mekong languages and there is translation. Okay, Rajesh. Uh, can I have like half a minute to myself? Okay, I just got back from Laos. I visited the uh, wind power projects, the largest wind power energy in Laos, in Southeast Asia. I think one of the very good examples of energy transition in Southeast Asia, I'm really impressive, but I won't say about that. Sorry, <laughs> I just let you know. But before, uh, before we go further, why don't we invite the first group, right, to come up here, but no states, right? Just standing here. What do you guys think? Do you want them on the stage or just around us? Around, around us. us. Excellent. Much better. Okay. Yeah. Ridhi and Ridhi. your co-facilitator. Okay, give your hands to the first group. Thank you so much.
The title of this first group is uh, How Can We Make Nature-Based Solutions Work for Climate Resilience and Biodiversity? Riddhi, you have about four minutes. Thank you so much, Rajesh. I'll try and keep it short and crisp. So our session had a lot of attendance. I hope it was one of the most popular sessions in the afternoon and everyone engaged uh, in the discussion. So the idea was how can we make use of nature-based solutions for both climate and biodiversity? So the first message that came out from the room was that uh, nature-based solution is not a panacea. So it's not a medicine for everything that we are facing globally in terms of the climate crisis, the biodiversity loss, and also pollution. So they do provide us a lot of solutions, but all these solutions need to be contextualized. Also, uh, there's, you know, a little less, uh, you know, confidence coming in from the policymakers. So what we need to do uh, to make uh, NBS a more lucrative option for them and also to consider it along with the hard infrastructure-based solutions. So we think that we need a more effective, efficient uh, cost-benefit analysis, and we need to demonstrate the core benefits that nature-based solutions are generating more efficiently. Also, by doing this, we need to build a business case so that we can present it out to investors who are ready to offer money for these solutions. And this would also bring in both public and private partnerships and also bring in uh, the private investment and also ensure that there is long-term sustainability to nature-based solutions, which are otherwise observed as you know, short-term solutions that are implemented for a while and after that they die out. And also one of the key things that was raised by the group and also our presenters was co-creation is key. So we cannot do it individually alone in silos. We have to do it all together. And I think, Anjali, you can you know, discuss more in detail about how do we co-create nature-based solutions. Over to you. Thank you so much. So taking on from where uh, Riddhi said that we need native nature-based solutions that are contextual, that are relevant and appropriate. Uh, what we did discuss in the um, panel was that collaboration then becomes key to actually arriving at this contextuality. And then collaboration in itself is not a uh, is not a is is not a uniform concept. So it needs to be, it has to be contextualized again to the nature of the problem, the scale at which the problem is, and the number of stakeholders who are invited uh, in, involved. So therefore, you can have, for instance, uh, some projects where just co-creation is done with some stakeholders. Another one where co-development and co-creation is done, co-implementation is done. So there are various shades and. Um, forms to collaboration and that's what we discussed and that has to be actually unpacked. So that was the first one and within the, we also discussed the uh, the voices of the community as critical to collaboration but then it's as Riddhi said, it's not just the community but the larger ecosystem of the stakeholders. So this could be community, community leaders, could be governments, could be civil society organizations, could be academia. But these, and even even uh, governments and elected representatives, for instance, and getting them to actually be a part of the system is critical to an adequate and appropriate framing of the problem, and by extension, then arriving at adequate and appropriate solutions. Of course, then, once that is done, how do you move from the pilot to a scaled-up uh, situation and how do you institutionalize these? This is something that we discussed in the latter half of the conversation and I'll leave that to Riddhi to cover. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Anjali, for highlighting the role of communities and how we need to co-create. And that is also a long time-consuming process, but certainly it's fruitful and builds the trust. So. From designing solutions, how do we scale them up? That's the next challenge. So all our great participants, speakers, and audience in this session came to the conclusion that 
we need to have a nexus of policy, also finance and governance to actually scale NBS. So all of that has to happen together. Also, when we talk about Mekong region uh, specifically, we saw that there is a room for improvement. There are a lot of things happening. We have to look at things more closely, not only just market NBS as profits, but also look at uh, the disservices which they might be generating along the process. Lastly, I would like to say that there are a lot of good practices out there, a lot of lessons learned. And also one of our speakers, Dr. Rafael, uh, highlighted that there's also an IUCN global standard which is available and can be applied across the globe to build more effective and uh, long-standing nature-based solutions. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really. Thank you. Big applause for group one, please. So, Ajahn Kanakun, before we go to the floor, can I ask a quick question? Sure, I also have you very, also have very one small question too. Because I, happened, I had the good fortune to be in this group. There's a wonderful discussion going on there. But there were a lot of terms going around and I yeah. was uh, intrigued by at least one. Uh, and I hope you can elucidate that. Community commons came up a little bit, if you may. I don't so, think I can hear your voice loud enough. Rajesh, can you say, can you ask question again? Okay. Yep. Can you talk us up through community commons, which came up in the context of NBS? So community commons, again, can be defined in very different ways and at different scales. But one scale that is often all overlooked is that of the, at the settlement scale, and especially in the uh, poor and the marginalized communities. The space, for example, just to give an uh, <laughs> just to kind of look at it. Uh, for example, in the uh, we have done some work around community commons, and one of the things we identified as a community common was the road outside in the urban poor settlement, the road outside the house, which becomes an extended space of the private space inside the house. Because that is so small, a lot of the activity spills onto, for example, the street that abuts the house, and in many ways that becomes a community common. And uh, what we did use over there was what we tried to understand over there was how do you how do you make these socially just and adaptive spaces through the implementation of nature-based solutions which allow that activity to happen. But community commons can be at different scale. They, they, they can be lakes, they can be um, parks, they can also be streets in the uh, global south context where a lot of the activity happens on the streets. Uh, it can be temples, it can be a lot of whole lot of other spaces. Excellent. Okay, Thank my you. turn. So, uh, so I, I heard about NBS very often. It's a kind of buzzword. So many people use this word. So what does it mean by NBS, nature-based solution? So I am doing research on this and also we're struggling how to define it and how we find a common understanding about the word and the concept. So maybe I would like to open the floor with this question and also, yep, Rajesh, you allow me to do this? Yes. yes. I would like to hear what does it mean by nature-based solution from your perspective and also from your research implementation working with local people or any other organizations. Of the floor is open for how long, Rajesh? How many minutes left? Five minutes, right? Five okay, minutes. we have five minutes. Ah, Dr. Juan, you have, please give the microphone to him. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is uh, Chu Pai Wang from IMI, International Water Management Institute. Uh, related to the natural based uh, solution, I have a more uh, uh, practical question and concern, and also can be answered. Mm. Okay. Recently, we have a serious uh, yagi storm go through the Mekong country, and in particular, influence strongly in Vietnam. With few hundred, uh, over 300, 400 people died, and a serious uh, damage, uh, mainly because of the landslide and flood. So people in Vietnam complain that 
the policy of the government is strong. Let people living at the slope and let people living at the high risk of the water plus flood. And also the deforestation convert many forests into plantation, like a rubber, like a durian export to China, etc. So they say that, and also the information rain phone system is not detailed enough. Only rain phone measure at district level and not detailed at commune level. So that the commune don't have information, don't have a forecast enough to avoid from disaster. So they say that looking at the Western country, we have to learn from Western country to avoid from this disaster. But unfortunately, about a few days or a week after, the hurricane Helen come through six days in US, and 200 people died with the serious damage similar due to landslide and flood in US. So our American dream fell. <laughs> so what happened is that uh, we many proposed back, we returned to natural base. But what is the definition of natural base solution? In this case, many agreements say that we should return to forestation and based on the natural forest before rather than plantation. Many agreements, and I think that now in Vietnam, we have a many proposal and many research and many policy recommendations back. But then the problem is that now we don't have uh, the lesson from other country to study mm. because the American dream fell. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we still have time. So back to the nature, the keyword from Dr. Huan. This is a very dialect and very, I think, practical definition. I'm sure there are other meanings or concepts related to this term. Or you can bring up any other questions as well to the group. <laughs> You are ready to be asked, right? Yes. Any hands? If not, I can go. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. You I had one more because I've been here yesterday as well, and we had the Me Mekong Forum, and there was this question of, and I think this is repeatedly what we came across la yesterday and today about scaling, scaling up, and uh, it came up in NBS as well. And I don't know if Riddhi can explain a bit about within our NBS, but also it seems there is a multi-dimension to scaling. And if you can explain about what this means. Thanks, thanks Rajesh. So um, with scaling, I think there's a lot of different angles and different views of how scaling can be done. So one of the words that comes often is scaling up. So there you're talking about the top level agenda setting, where you're talking about having the right policies in place, having the right governance frameworks uh, there, who can, which can drive uh, the NPS implementation on ground. But in addition to that, I think there's also something called scaling deep, right? So we are also looking at co-creation, co-designing, co-implementing. So we are trying to look at what all values are being impacted by NBS. So looking at all of that together. So they're scaling up, they're scaling deep, and also they're scaling down. So you're also aware of the barriers that you will face while you're trying to implement NBS in any landscape or more place-based solutions that you're, that you're designing. So this needs to be more innovatively address, you can bring in different forms of knowledge, you can bring in different tools, you can bring in the finance, you can bring in the marketing, uh, you know, different marketing products, and then that's how you scale it down. You find out innovative ways of managing those barriers there. And also there's something uh, like scaling out. What does scaling out mean? 
I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the best practices that exist out there on nature-based solutions. So how do you scale out? How can we communicate better about these practices out there? How we can build that confidence and also spread that message across to the wide range of stakeholders that this is something that we can replicate. This has the potential and this can then be disseminated further and you know, taken up by different governments across the regions and also landscapes. So I think, Rajesh, this is something that we also need to look at, not just scaling up, scaling deep, scaling down, and also scaling out. Yeah, thanks. Excellent, thanks. Uh, these are topics that we will come back to, the next three groups as well. Uh, so over to you, Ashan Kanakwan. Okay, I think we still have like time for this group, right? Oh, thumbs up. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. And then we thank you so much for the first group. Thank you so much. I'm sure you have a lot more questions, but you can like post that. You, uh, you can, can post your questions uh, to, the, to the group later on. Like, yes, we move to the second one. Second group, but a reminder okay. that they are here. And when the four groups are finished, we're still going to have an overall discussion. So uh, keep thoughts on NBS in your mind. Park it for now. Okay, can I invite uh, the second group, moderated by Stefan, Just Green Energy Solutions for Urban Resilience, including air pollution and heat. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Yay, energy, that's great. Um, uh, I apologize to the translators. I will speak very fast because we have to make the time. Um, oh, uh, our slides uh, uh, functioned as well, we have typed up some key messages. I apologize, all the typos are for your own amusement um, because I cannot type fast. Um, we had a very interesting session, how to make energy transition just and green in the urban context. And we divide our key messages into four different um, sectors, so to speak. We have policy, technology, finance, and last but not least, people. And maybe we should switch around and make people first, actually. But again, didn't have time. Sorry. Um, policy, uh, we need to bring the private sector into the conversation and think what regulation are useful for that. To have the private sector in there, because not, the government cannot only finance the solutions on their own. We need private sector support. Interconnection, intersection was mentioned, no silo thinking. That's a key message to our policymaking friends here. Uh, climate change issues, resilience is not only an issue for the environmental ministry or for the energy ministry, it is an issue for many ministries. So we have to, policymakers should work in silos on, uh, not in silos, sorry, on that. Um, we need holistic and regional approaches, system thinking. Solutions uh, require different angles to be explored. Different angles have to be satisfied in order to make energy transition just and workable. And then we had one interesting perspective is don't change the whole regulatory system. Just do some little tweaks and some little tweaks will add up to something very useful actually, especially when there is finance involved. How to, can we incentivize finance? Well, tweak existing regulations, um, for instance, make it so that uh, electricity providers, you, when you build a solar panel on your roof, that you can actually feed back this electricity to the grid. This is not possible uh, at the moment in Thailand, for instance, and I will invite my colleague to speak on that a little bit. Um, so good regulations, tweaking regulations would be a key message. We have technology, um, combining the right economic package, especially we talked about energy efficiency here. If you have the right economic package and the incentives are aligned, then people will actually buy that because everybody's interested in keeping their electricity prices and their energy bill low. Um, technology must respond to local needs and local conditions. Southeast Asia is a huge region and what works in Indonesia in one island might not work uh, um, in a mountainous region in Thailand, for instance, in Chiang Mai. So we have to have Technology has to respond to local conditions and the need of the people. Finance, of course. Um, and this was a very inter interesting and inspiring um, example given by Ingo. Um, maybe we can get inspired by industries and businesses who are not in the climate field. And Ingo, I think, mentioned um, in Australia, but also I've heard in Sub-Saharan Africa, the people who invest the most in solar power are telecommunications uh, um, companies. So maybe we can uh, um, be inspired. What is their business model? Why do they invest and how can they bring 
uh, renewable solutions to the people. Maybe other industries can follow suit. Um, carbon price and carbon taxation was uh, identified as a really important issue. If there is no just price on carbon, um, people will not follow and buy um, the technologies or invest in the technologies. And then for the people aspect, I would in invite my colleague here, who was a very participant, a very good participant, um, to speak about how can you bring the people into the fold and local communities and help them to embrace renewable energies. Over to you. Sure. Thank you for a very excellent wrap up or an, uh, our group discussion. So in the group two, we are discussing about so many ongoing kind of possibility when we're speaking about the urban lessons. And of course, as you see earlier, so we have uh, Miss Jacqueline, we have also Mr. Tian from Colleaf, we have myself and also uh, Mr. Ingle, and with a good kind of moderation from Stefan and great input from you, Becky. And um, yeah, I think from the perspective um, that we discussed is already shared by Stefan already, just to um, give a little bit more compliment on that. I think when we are speaking about the policy itself, so as uh, Stefan mentioned, it has to be integrated uh, plan and also policy. It's not just about the, the sectoral integrated plan between ministry, but also we are now talking about the solution for the uh, climate change mitigation, but also like adaptations. And we are so speaking about the solutions about current situations on the uh, flooding in many areas in uh, Asia, Southeast Asia. So uh, when, when flooding and then uh, the second maybe choice, maybe many people go for like uh, less using candle, right? Because we, have, we don't have electricity anymore. But if we are thinking about what could be the more solutions on that, maybe solar rooftop and also battery could be also used for the emergency solutions for the climate adaptations like that as well. And then we are also talking about many options for technology and also Tian mentioned about energy efficiency in building sector, which is very good. But also beyond that, the technology here, we are also mentioning about transparency. So bringing whatever there, like information management to become transparent, and that means it's manageable. That's also important when we are speaking about the urban uh, resilience. And also, we are talking so many things about the finance mechanism, but one of the things which is important is the carbon pricing, which has now become the priority uh, policy for many countries. But the question is how we can ensure we recycling that money into something support the renewable energy ramp up and also energy efficiency. Because in many cases, energy efficiency is the low hanging fruit solution and which is uh, sometimes you should um, not only focusing on the supply side, but also reducing the demand. And lastly, the people participations, as uh, Stefan mentions, like renewable energy, we are have talking more kind of more diverse group of people. Although it's bringing the choice on your table now, but the ability of people to reach out to that kind of solutions or you know, just energy transition is different, depends on conditions, your capacity, your finance situation. But the people, how to make people really ensure that affordable to those technology and really have a chance and really have the capacity to grab that chance is the questions about how to reskill people, how to make people aware about, you know, the benefit that they can get from renewable. It's not only the power that gives you the light, but it's also, this is something can give you more jobs, also give you more money by selling electricity to your neighbors. And that will be something um, which is we should highlight more, especially for the uh, vulnerable people like low income. What is the opportunity that come from this kind of technology policy uh, finance model change? Thank you. Thank you, Stefan and the team. Thank you so much. I think we have only three minutes for the floor uh, to raise question or to ask the team to clarify. I think we have like three minutes and a half. I give you another half minute, please. So really thematics, no, there's the, a the screen gone. <laughs> so policy, finance, and technology, technology and people. people. So four themes, you have any? Things to say, to ask, why are you quiet? It's been a long day. A long day. <laughs> well, just wait. 
Oh, oh okay. Thank you so much, uh, John. Thank you. I'm just interested. Are there any psychologists in this room? <laughs> any? No? Behavioral science? No? None. I think we're missing a lot. Yeah. Because to me, climate change, environment issues are, is a behavioral problem. Ah. If we really want to tackle it, then we have to change behavior, right? All of us. <laughs> you know, change agents, right? Okay. Start today? All right. Anyway, so maybe we should, uh, especially in research or academic circles, we should think about, I uh, Google just now, there is thing, a concept called sustainable behavior. Okay, maybe we need to tweak or we need to refine or expand or whatever, you know? But I think if we really want to make a difference, huh? in my view at least, uh, I think we need to really change our lifestyle, our mindsets, and mm. so on. Yeah? Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Ka Jan. Thank you so much. We need change, particularly our behavior change. And uh, anyone would like to talk about Jet C or anything within this theme? Ka Jan, Chen Pa. Good afternoon, everyone. I just uh, supplement uh, for, from uh, earlier uh, speaker. I think when we talk about the uh, uh, entity, right? Entity is, uh, I think, is a major issue, especially for our regional uh, to talk together. Especially uh, the country around the world, they also uh, set the target. For example, carbon neutrality or even net zero for the year, at least 2050. Uh, that, that kind of thing is uh, on the side of policy. But when we talk about uh, uh, policy, technology, uh, finance people, the important thing when we are going to action, mm. I think it's very important. Policy is policy. If policy is no action, just policy, uh, since we already have the target, how, how we get there. We have to work on the, not just only action plan for, for the country, action plan for the region, how we share our uh, natural resources, especially when we talk about the uh, clean uh, energy, what is the sort of uh, energy uh, come from, uh, that uh, we are ready uh, for like uh, renewable energy, for saying that uh, some country also say, uh, still talk about the, uh, the uh, sort of energy from uh, petroleum bed or something like that, how we uh, get there, I think it's very important. Thank you very much, look like it's a huge gap between policy and practice. You think, Stefan, you have anything to respond? Um, yes, um, I completely agree with the uh, behavioral issue. Um, I think we don't tap enough into this kind of behavioral sciences, behavioral economics, how we can um, incentivize people to make more sustainable decisions. I think this is something to investigate further. Um, we have worked a little bit on, on these kind of issues at SCI in the past. And then again, um, raising awareness and changing truly behavior is something different, but I completely agree with this. Um, so maybe if we can have a chat afterwards um, over a, a glass of wine or a fruit juice, and then maybe... There are some donors here in the room who can finance this project. No, I'm kidding. Um, um, uh, um, but I think this is really, really important. And maybe it was a little bit cut short in our discussion, this kind of behavioral aspect. So thank you very much for this uh, uh, um, addition, very valuable addition to these kind of key messages. And of course, holistic approaches are always needed. I mean, we always talk about this, but then it's very easy to forget uh, to bring people on board, uh, reach out, talk to people you maybe not, you don't agree with. I think that's also very important. I don't know whether... Tiana has something to add to this, to you, or somebody else in my group, actually, because I have. Time's up, Time's up or already. <laughs> but, okay, okay, fine. I'm sorry, I'm intervening. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Give your back big hands to the second group, and now over to the third one. Rajesh. Thank you, Ashan. Third group. Can I ask Albert to come? The name of the group is Transboundary Climate Risks: Designing Actions and Solutions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rajesh. Um, Actually, the, the point that was raised by Ajahn Apichai earlier on, on psychology was the last point he made in our session. 
So we've already started our key message there. So the, the, the issues that we discussed were around transboundary climate risk. An important point that we have raised is that adaptation is not necessarily neutral. One country's adaptation is, might be the source of maladaptation of other countries. In other words, if we don't plan a country's adaptation properly, if we do not think also of other countries, we might be creating problems for other countries. So that was the important part. Now, because we're talking about transboundary, we try to be cross demographics as well. So we will start with uh, a, 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 an, an intern working with us who is a student at uh, Chiang Mai University who will present the key messages and also his reflection of what he heard about uh, uh, transboundary climate risk. And then we will also ask if there's time for Ajahn Apichai's reflections with regards to the overall geopolitics in the region around regional integration, because I think there's a lot of important issues there that we can take, uh, we can learn from. So can I ask Tony to go through the key messages and also your reflection? Um, hello, everyone. Again, I'm Tony. So briefly, our panel talked about transboundary climate risks. And by nature, it is a complex issue in that one, it's a risk literally generated not within your jurisdiction. So even if you want to address it, it requires others um, beyond your jurisdiction, beyond your sovereign land to address it as well. Secondly, as an issue as well, it is complicated in that it is underpinned by complex um, geopolitical realities. Um, all, all of us here may have our own shared experiences on that in that how that particular um, form of problem in climate change makes it difficult in that it traverses boundaries, yet cooperation is not something that's easily achieved. A core theme, in fact, of the discussion in the past two, three days have been trust, and it takes a long time, but risks happen oftentimes in an um, immediate manner. So that's one, the, the complexity of it. However, we did not stop with that. We obviously needed to unpack that complexity and try to identify potential solutions from that. Um, the most immediate one that was discussed, obviously, is through um, regional governance. And Ajahn Pichaya, uh, Pichaya um, uh, reflected on several, uh, on the history of um, ASEAN and Mekong region in terms of addressing these things, citing instances of solutions and, um, and then instances of perhaps uh, it not being enough. And a core message there is learning from our past experiences of um, cooperation. And... However, um, the interesting part of the discussion is that it also tried to go beyond a traditional way of understanding the solution. Because again, the traditional approach of um, regional governance can have its own limitation. So the discussion also highlighted two things that I think are very important. The first is on people-to-people -people cooperation, in that um, while the risks are transboundary, the impacts are local between different boundaries, right? So therefore, Cooperation between those um, communities, such as data sharing, and even um, sh cooperation in different facets of governance, such as in the private sector and CSOs, might be a pathway towards addressing transboundary risks. Now, for my personal reflection of it, and as a public policy scholar interested in, for in, interested in critical foresight and critical policy studies, one way that we discuss um, policy solutions addressing you know, complexity is to reimagine it from new uh, metaphors. And this is not my um, uh, metaphor, but it was actually Albert's, that um, adaptation without borders. And what I find interesting about that is that it recognizes the fact that adaptation is not politically neutral. But at the same time, it requires solutions that go beyond perhaps how we traditionally understand it from a border perspective. Um, and in doing so, perhaps that's one way of addressing, uh, of addressing it by reimagining relationships, not within borders, but in terms of shared relationships and perhaps shared histories. I don't know if that's a, a pathway towards that, but it's fundamentally a, another uh, metaphor in terms of how we can address transboundary climate risks. I'm sure um, all of us will have our own metaphors of trying to reimagine that as well, but that's worthwhile to, link, um, to think of as well. Okay, um, Ajahn, do you have something to say? So to add a little bit, uh, I mean, we talk about intergovernmental, you know, uh, systems or organizations. 
I mean, as I'm sure you're all familiar, right? My Mekong River Commission or ASEAN, which I'm a bit more familiar with. Uh, and, but you know, one uh, Singaporean diplomat, now retired, he said, you know, this is referring to ASEAN, huh? many people think uh, ASEAN should be like a horse, should go fast, huh? gallop. Why are you so slow? Why are you like NATO? No action talk only. Or why are you huh? like a paper tiger? Yeah, they're having a summit now. In fact, if I have a chance, I will speak to the leaders too. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, that's another story. But then he says, but you know, you don't have to understand the nature of the beast, hmm, the creature. He said, Asian is more like a cow. Very slow. But nation states like to milk it, you know? And they like to benefit from it. So if you think Asian can be a horse, then maybe you are going down the wrong track. But ASEAN, in effect, is probably like the latter, okay? Okay, so that's just one analogy. Um, and then, how many of you are biologists in this room? Biology, ecosystem, ecologists, none? Ah, yeah, one minority, yeah? You know, nowadays, I think we all should be proud. Because nowadays, people talk about going viral. Viral means virus. Virus in biology, originate in biology, right? It's a microorganism, right? So now it's going viral, all right? Or everything, computer, everywhere is going viral. And then the other thing is ecosystems. Originally, it's an ecosystem, uh, ecological concept, but now it becomes very big. Yeah? And then finally, we heard about taxonomy, right? Uh, if you're a botanist, geologist, you know what taxonomy is. So, yeah. so we should be proud, yeah? and I think biologists do have a role to play. And then this was my undergraduate degree. And then I went to the graduate school. I went to actually into water resource management, okay? And so I was from the biology angle, you know, taking water sample analysis, then write a report, submit, discuss, finish, right? And then one day, there was a professor in my program in water resources. He's coming from the mass communication journalism school. He was talking to us seminar, you know, graduate seminar. You know students, water management is only 10% water management and 90% people management. At first I was scratching my head, what is this is he talking about, you know? I didn't have too much people to deal with. I analyzed my water submit report, that's it, All right, fine. Unless, okay, you do you have some, you argue about my technical, you know, results or whatever. But over the course of my 40 or so years of professional experience, I think he has some wisdom in it. It's not to say 10 or 90 or 65, 25, 40 or whatever, but basically he's trying to say, don't forget the people factor in any management, <laughs> right? So it may, even management school talks about people. So, and I think it goes back to behavior, like what I was talking about. So maybe in the end you go, 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 go in circles, come around and say, oh, maybe it's back to you and me and us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ajahn. I think we, yeah, Sin, yeah. Can I have something to say about what you just discussed about uh, the speed? And we all are motivated to speed our development. But we don't know where to hit. If we speed into the direction, it's the disaster, then we reach the disaster sooner. So it, with this kind of message, we have to think about what is another, another, trip, uh, uh, another alternative way of thinking about development. And the, the, the concept of development and growth, actually growth is not actually developed from our context. People develop, but not for growth. People develop for sustain, uh, subsistence uh, need. And in this kind of thing that I think that uh, the book uh, written by the Schumacher about small is beautiful, is give us some thought of th some thought about some kind of he wrote a chapter on Buddhist economy. So that's something we have to think about. What Dr. Tsai just mentioned about what happening in Vietnam and what happening in the U.S. Naturally, we are the same facing the same problem, regardless which kind of system we are doing that right now, but we, we face the same problem.
So the question is, we usually think that we or you have to change, but not, never ask me, why I should change in the first place? And this, this kind of thing that I think we, if individuals think that we have to change ourselves first, before saying that you or the other have to change. And that's something I just want to raise this kind of issue today, because you just mentioned about psychological, but I just mentioned about some kind of from Buddhism point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Sin. Thank you so much. Since the third person who said, small is beautiful, Sin this morning, he's the third one. That's what I have heard today. Thank you so much. And then we will hear more about this sentence. Okay, I think we'll, time's not uh, much. Up. I would like to invite the last group one, four. the okay. last group. Okay. Please. Uh, the, shall I, okay, shall I invite the last the group? Finance Anas people. Financing, climate resilience, yes, and <laughs> sustainability. The finance people. The finance people. together in group four. Yeah, a lot of terminology is about finance. Hello. Okay. Uh, even though we are the finance people here in this room, however, everything we had, possibly everything we have covered in our session was also mentioned today in other sessions. Because this is exactly uh, one of the things that we need to achieve the climate action, to achieve the climate goals. Uh, basically, we need more funding for that. Otherwise, how can we do that? So uh, we did speak about a lot of things that, and you can see one uh, phrase that is highlighted. So I'm going to present the results from our group. Um, that small is beautiful, small is big. And it was actually the last, again, but not least presentation that happened in our session uh, was about the role of small businesses, small initiatives. We talk a lot about what governments can do, what big businesses can do, what investors can do. However, we very infrequently speak about what small businesses, small time projects can do. And this is exactly one of the ways for us also to achieve inclusivity, because this is also something that we maybe don't speak enough, how climate finance can reach the vulnerable groups of people. And the smaller you go, the most probable is that the goal is going to be achieved. So small projects, small businesses are the key also. They should not be ignored. We know that, of course, big businesses, multinationals, they have larger capacity to mobilize finance. And this is where we start speaking about private finance, because we know that public finance is not sufficient for us to achieve climate action. For instance, if you look at our uh, takeaways from the session, annual incremented, incremental investment that is necessary is $3 trillion annual. And now, again, there are many estimates, but this is one of the numbers that one of our presenters today brought up. And before, we did speak about 100 billion until the year 2030. In the reality, we know that 100 billion may not be even sufficient for one particular country to achieve the climate goals. So the gap is much larger than we have imagined, than we have considered before. And this is why we need all hands on deck with this. What else is necessary that was mentioned in our session is uh, that, of course, there has to be partnership. Not one single entity can achieve that. And we talked a lot today to avoid silo thinking, silo mentality, not only in the governments, but also in other stakeholders. Because we see a lot that different stakeholders, even the multinationals and uh, multilaterals are doing a lot, but don't know and don't consider what other ones are doing. So silo thinking has to be eliminated. And this is also why we are here to contribute to information sharing. So policy coherence is also one of those factors. Obviously, policies need to be in line with whatever priorities we have set up uh, for ourselves. Um, Countries should have proper financial plans also uh, 
in line with the NDCs that they have promised. And there's one thing here that is also uh, another issue in climate finance that everyone knows about is the lack of bankability. Finance, climate finance is whatever finance is economics and it has to go in line with economic principles. However, if it's not bankable, if it's not investable, there's not going to be sufficient of investing. So this is also the role of the government here to provide certain de-risking mechanisms to provide for the investors, to provide this incentive to the investors. So we talked a lot about that. Also, uh, of course, the attention to energy transition, but it's not, not, also, not only adaptation, but also mitigation. Again, this is what we see in different countries with which we work. In some countries, experts are saying uh, adaptation is not being paid sufficient attention to. And in other countries, they're saying there is just too much happening in adaptation, but mitigation is ignored. And we see those things happening, those different countries, they have different proportions of this adaptation mitigation. Um, so bankable, sustainable projects are not there. Private sector is not sufficiently involved. Um, also, uh, something was said about uh, local market, local currencies being also uh, put up front this, this process. Uh, next, uh, our, uh, another speaker spoke about capacity building a lot also and how different multilaterals can uh, participate in the capacity building and also uh, support different projects. So one of the speakers spoke about how uh, their facility can provide support to various investment projects in climate, fin in, in climate action uh, to bring them through this whole way to achieve the goals. Um, circular economy was also one of the things mentioned. Uh, one of the ways uh, we can actually reduce this gap, not providing more finance, but actually needing less finance. Circular economy is uh, the key. And we had quite interesting examples from, uh, from one of our speakers about how we in our everyday life can also be, uh, can also participate, can create the circular economy. And uh, quite interesting business projects already exist in Thailand. For instance, there was one project mentioned how, if, for instance, you want to change a mattress in your house, it's quite difficult because you cannot get rid of the old one. And a lot of us has been through, have been through that. So a project mentioned in terms of uh, circular economy was actually renting the mattress and uh, later on returning it to the company. Quite interesting circular economy example. And uh, again, I'm coming down to the uh, small is big, small is beautiful small uh, businesses. This was our last speech, which probably we had to cut down our time and my speaker is there. <laughs> So, uh, we also did have a few questions that we did not address during our session. I don't know, maybe you want to say a few words, Ms. Hein? Can we uh, open it to the floor and maybe she can yeah. respond? Okay, okay, okay. Because you've already used yeah, uh, because, uh, up time for the that. presentation. We sure. will have, give you an option to respond to the floor. Oh, I see. So, okay. shall we open you. it to the floor, Yeah, yeah please, Rajesh. Any questions to the, from the floor and uh, the group can respond. Cynthia. Thanks very much. I was in the session and it was very, very interesting. The thing that came to mind with me, and I know we didn't have time to discuss, so I wanted to throw it to the floor, was that it, this raises a couple of links to the wonderful opening talks this morning, the, um, the openings and the, the keynotes. And one of the opening sessions said that um, we have to pay attention to not be shoveling water off the deck of a sinking ship, but, but we are building a new ship. And it was very clear that the financing is essential to build the new ship. 
the key, the other speaker, however, before that said, we are in a mess and to get out of the mess we need to transform the systems. And what struck me, and we didn't have time to engage with it very much, is that finance as it's being constructed is not about transforming the systems. It's about getting more money to build the ship. But the ship is still as flawed as the current ship. So I think that's one of the next level questions is at what level are we changing some of the issues in the decision making, in the responsiveness of the products? Um, are we addressing some of the issues where small is beautiful, but if we're mirroring microfinance, that itself has been tremendous but has been reinforcing issues like debt crises at the micro level and, and people losing their homes and forced migration and that type of issue. And I know we have people who can speak to that. So I just wanted to, to raise that, that this is a fantastic way to build the new ship. And let's bring with us the questions about what do we need to transform in the systems to make sure this next ship will float and get everybody on board. Sin. Yeah, one more, maybe one question from Sin. Okay, along the line. Yes, my name is uh, Bak Thun Singh. Uh, I'm based in Hanoi. Just following this, this uh, thought about uh, the concept of uh, circular economy development. So it's, I feel that something is developed somewhere, not in our region, about the concept of circular economy. Because we think about circular, but in not term of economy, circular in everything. So if some of you could uh, remember some week ago, there's a, a, a workshop on localizing of the uh, circular economy in Asia, with the ASEAN uh, valued. So take some, something that uh, we have a long history of how to live with the nature and how to be regular, uh, circular in, in our philosophy. So if we just thought about everything to, to promote the idea of circular economy. But is this the same way we develop? Then we just speed up our development in the way that we, we have a disaster. So that's why I think that we should try to find out what ASEAN have some value to, uh, to, to offer. And in this case, I think in our, in our uh, traditional value, we have a lot of uh, the term of regular. The circular. We, we, we don't imp uh, import from, from abroad. For example, uh, the, the idea of uh, integrate of, uh, uh, of uh, which we call in, in Vietnamese, outro is garden, uh, uh, spawn, and then the, the husbandry. So this is actually a system of how you live in the nature. My point is that we have to find something from our region to have something to add to this kind of discussion. And I feel that if you remember the first talk about uh, Professor from, from, from the University, he mentioned about the human, di human dimension in a cultural aspect. Yeah. Our discussion is a little missing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth Sansin. Okay, I think we have like 20 minutes. Can I request something? Can I, please? I would like to hear new voices. New faces who never talk or who never had any chance to talk at all over the past three days. Two, yeah. Of course, we like to have the old faces, but also we need the new one too. Before you get too tired, before you go home and enjoy your life this evening, please, we have 20 minutes for you. Any questions, any issue you would like to discuss, suggested by Bastan Sin, we need to discuss more because the issue is so complicated and involve, you know, politics as well. No one talk about politics, but I, I love politics. Sorry about that. But I just would like you to talk about something, maybe different angles, different issues you would like to bring up, but we haven't talked at all over the past Three, three days and also today's session. So, welcome. Yes. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kobrat. I'm the second batch of the fellowship. 
Uh, my point is about, I think it's on the, um, the third group on the, tran on the transboundary risk. So my background is more or less from certification and I'm thinking that based on my background, potentially there's already a, a tool out there but just nobody is aware of. Just giving you an example, some certification scheme that is very credible. I mean, I'm not promoting my own scheme like FSC, for example. It has a mechanism of PFA or policy for association and we have done several cases of investigation for certified company that do not really comply with our certification requirements. And it doesn't have to be about the forest management certified company can be any chain of custody. Basically, FSC says, if, if any of the chain of custody company, if they ever do any kind of deforestation, mm -hmm. then all of the supply chain will not be able to certify at all. And we, there are several cases out there, like in Asia as well, like I'm sure the, the people in Cambodia, they would be well aware of Bon Sucro and what happened in Cambodia with, with Midpon company, for example. Midpon, that, that, yeah. So, um, I think my point is that there are several tools out here that we could explore, but maybe you're not mentioning and certification could be one of them. Thank you so much. Wow, very nice. I, I saw that hand. Thank you. Cheyenne is a thumb up, right? Uh, thank you, Cheyenne, uh, for uh, encouraging me to uh, raise my voice. Uh, first of all, I would like to say, uh, to show my appreciation to the organizer and the uh, program committee to, have the, uh, to uh, give me the chance to join this event. And uh, talking about the community development uh, and uh, uh, continue with this morning's beautiful uh, statement. Uh, when we talk to the community, uh, for example, they, 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 they sharing about the microfinance. Uh, the poor people, they receiving the support from the government, such as like one cow, but they, they, they don't have the cave for the cow, so they need to get the loan from the bank. Mm. And so when the home village, they receive the subsidy, like the cows and the price of the cows now decreasing dramatically, and eventually when they're selling the coat, the, the money is not enough to cover for their loan. Oh. So they need to uh, migrate to the big city, to work in the, in the big factories to pay back the loan. So my voice here, that's when you guys are thinking about a solution for the community, mm -hmm. please uh, take care about their concern and also their background mm -hmm. and also their demands. Not just think that, okay, we think this solution is suitable for them, is uh, workable, but actually it's, it's not. Yeah, Thank you're you. talking about more small people can make different, but you need to support them, right? You. you need to understand them, their location, their position. Okay, I think, yeah, great. Hi, I am representing the creative and entertainment industries, which I might be the only person in the room, but I know all of you consume these. You watch movies, you listen to music, you buy clothes. This is all part of the creative industries, but what I have noticed is, so I work at the intersection of climate action, culture, and entertainment. It's a new sort of uh, intersectional space, but I've noticed when I'm in these spaces, I'll ask people, like I met some climate finance people last week, and I said, have you ever thought about the creative industries in climate mm. finance? And the question, or the answer is always no. And so I am sort of opening my mouth and calling attention that this needs to be more brought together. Mm. And that, you know, storytelling narrative, it brings an emotional connection to some of these very difficult topics and we all need to come together. And also, artists are very similar to scientists. There's a lot of trial and error, a lot of experimentation. And when I have worked in collaborations with scientists, they're so excited to work on an art project. So I think that there needs to be less siloed. Mm. Uh, I mean, they're just silos. There's tons of silos, particularly in climate. And so I welcome anybody that wants to get to know the creative industries more, to come talk to me, and um, I'm available. So thank you. Wow, wow. Wonderful. I really like the word emotion, so embedded in climate change or climate risk. I'm also working on uh, feminist political ecology. See, 
emotion, feelings, part of the knowledge production is considered as knowledge, scientific as well, data as well, from my perspective. So we not separate society from emotion. We cannot, we cannot separate, right? Sin, you're a scientist. Okay. I would like to see more hands. We still have time. Yes. Okay. Uh, hi. Um, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit and um, introduce myself and where I'm connected. Uh, so I'm Jean. I'm actually the adaptation specialist of the UNFCCC Regional Collaboration Center for Asia and the Pacific. I'm not sure if everyone in the room knows that there's a regional office that you can talk to as well when you want to connect with networks, with um, technology, uh, technical assistance providers, capacity building providers in the region. So please do, I, I, I'm in the application. You can search my name there and we can connect. Um, so just a little introduction to also address, you know, the repeating comments on siloed work and to also make sure that whatever we discuss at international level is something that we can also, you know, scale down a little bit more at the regional or sub-regional levels. Um, the RCC, uh, the Regional Collaboration Center for Asia and the Pacific, have specialists for NDC, um, load um, Econo economy development and mitigation. We also have specialists for Article 6 for adaptation, climate action, which includes uh, coordination with you know, the vulnerable sectors like women, indigenous people, youth, and making sure that they, they are meaningfully engaged in the process, which also came in some of the discussions earlier. And we have also our regional lead to also look into like the broader support and uh, gaps and challenges that we experience at the regional and sub-regional levels. So we're based in Bangkok. Um, if ever you want to get in touch with us, especially for the upcoming uh, UNFCCC related processes, as we know that the COP29 is happening in Baku and, uh, soon from November 11. Um, please feel free to reach out to us because we have this regional presence as well to help out countries. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. You know, so glad to know that you have a chance to say about your organization, your work so far. And also, I really like the first and the second uh, 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 persons, people here, talking about how we break silo. It's very key word. I, I heard from yesterday too, and this morning too. So I think it's very key thing that we need to consider carefully. And also we think, how are we gonna do that? When we talk about climate change, when we talk about climate risk, resilience, and livelihood adaptation, blah, blah, blah. We can work alone. We need friends, we need colleagues, we need many different people, many diff different disciplines. Thank you so much for bringing this up. Can I also ask any journalists in the room? Because yeah. Yeah, you also <laughs> often offer us a fresh perspective. We miss the wood for the trees. Um, any journalists want to come and tell us what we are doing wrong? You're a journalist? No. no. <laughs> Kevin, okay, go. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I'm Kevin. Actually, I'm coming from Hong Kong, but I'm now based in Bangkok. Uh, just I actually, I come here because actually I have been friends with, uh, I know someone for many years actually, so I um, uh, have a lot, a lot of connections with SEI and a lot of programs. So um, my, my kind of takeaway so far actually, well, today is very fruitful. I mean, the discussions, you know, pack of many different terms and actually terminologies and concepts and ideas and probably some already practice. But um, I also observed that um, there's a call for, you know, unpacking those different terms and terminologies. I think it is very important that uh, to realize the, I mean, the, the, the good concept like Jack C. Of course, yesterday, actually, we talked about intersectionality. We talked about Jack C, how to really localize it. I think it is very important because um, so far, I, I couldn't see much, actually, of these kind of... Um, uh, good concept could be could be contextualized in, in local uh, local communities and well, probably in the, in Mekong countries. So I really really hope that we can um, you know um, build a build a narrative build a narrative together to to really make it happen. Yeah, 
just my just observation so far. And then the second thing is that, uh, okay, the last thing actually is about the process. I mean, probably to start a process locally is also important, yeah. Because at the, so far we just talk, talk, talk here in the room, and probably we all agree with that, but um, probably to localize it in, in, the, in, in process, into a process, I think is very important. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. So you are calling for uh, implementation of the concept. The linkage between theory and con theory concept and practices. I like it. Particularly intersectionality is very complicated, very hard to understand, and very hard also to implement the idea, but we make it happen. I, I'm sure Shayanis, SEI, would have to push ahead of this concept, how to make it happen. It's on the ground. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you, Alberto Isgue from ESCA. Uh, talking about uh, breaking sil silos, you know, for us, a really important silo is between finance and planning, from the development plans and the financing. And at the UN, uh, there has been a, an idea called Integrated National Financing Frameworks, which, uh, you know, addresses precisely this point. Uh, so the idea is that when there is a development plan, I mean, you have to ask, okay, how much it's gonna cost, where the money come, will come from. And there has to be connection between planning and, and, and the Ministry of Finance for that, right? But a particular application of INFF, this is Integrated National Financing Frameworks, is for the, for the NDCs. Because uh, normally uh, the NDCs usually don't have financial information at all. Sometimes the, the amount is not quite there, it's difficult to find. But beyond that, I mean, it's very important to know uh, where the money will come from, you know, for the NDCs. So we are proposing to, to prepare financial plans for the NDCs. It's one of our recommendations. Thank you. Can I ask where the money comes from? Yes. You, how, much? how much? Anyone provide an, an answer? Where the money come from? <laughs> I'm also curious about this too. Yeah. Uh, okay, you first. I saw your hand. Thank you. uh, I'm Christina Gregorio from UNDP. So I don't have the actual answer where the money will come from because money can come from different places. But I'd just like to respond to two questions. The first was the earlier comment on the sinking ship. Mm. And the second one is on the silos and intersectionality. I think the financial sector is really transforming. Um, maybe small is beautiful, so the, the impact is not yet as obvious to many, but uh, as mentioned by our keynote speaker, there's so many people already working in this sector in climate finance alone. So there are more sector specialists understanding more about finance and vice versa. Ministries of finance understanding more about the different sector work to inform the planning so that they could really assign budgets. And if they can't assign budgets, they're able to meet different stakeholders similar to what was discussed uh, in this mm. afternoon. So they can understand whether they have to pursue blended finance or just purely private sector philanthropy or relate to SMEs. And I'd like to just also follow up to what um, Alberto mentioned of UNSCAP on INFFs because it's also a very, it's a global program also of UNDP. So um, what we do is that if, with countries that have NDCs and NAPs, the National Adaptation Plans, we're actually supporting them with these financing strategies so that even if a country knows what it wants, they have tools to be able to decide for themselves which source of finance would be most suitable for the solution that they have identified mm. and decided to pursue. So it's still a lengthy process and it requires a lot of stakeholders and especially working with the communities. So this is uh, it's something that is, cannot be answered just in a day, but many partners are working on it um, together with SEI, of course. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I, I, before you, I think I saw hands over there. No? No, okay. Can I uh, give the microphone to this gentleman first? Because the answer, you, you, I think you might talk related to her. Yes, I think so. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom McInerney. I'm at Loyola University and also an affiliated fellow with the SEI here in Asia. Um, one issue I think it was alluded to this morning, um, uh, referred to as the elephant in the room, is, is the uh, question of uh, collusion between government and, and the business community. And I think I want to raise a, a similar but, but uh, bigger issue, which is the rule of law 
and governance. And I think for a lot of the kinds of changes that we want to see happen, and certainly in terms of the resource mobilization needs that we've referred to, which are uh, noticeably uh, much, much uh, greater than the amount of financing that's been made available, um, there is a need for mobilization of interested communities and actors at the domestic level to be able to contest the policies of their governments. And so the question of civic space, the question of environmental defenders, do people have the right to speak out? As um, our colleague this morning referred to, uh, actors speak out at their peril and they can be sued in court, uh, you know, the slap type lawsuits, they can really uh, be subjected to tremendous harm. And we've also seen how many environmental defenders have uh, lost their lives or, or been uh, incarcerated for their activism. So I think that this question of rule of law, I realize that there, there are peculiarities and, and uh, sensitivities here in the region that make this a challenge, but certainly in recent years the notion of the environmental rule of law has been gaining uh, recognition. Um, we also see, you know, we talk about business as being part of the solution. Of course business is part of the solution, but business is also part of the problem. And so there's this question of the business and human rights, and certainly there's been a whole lot of work done in terms of the UN guiding principles and, and that whole process. Um, but how that links up to the environmental dimension is another key part of the equation here. And so I think to the extent that it's possible to inject a degree of rule of law and thinking about rule of law and protection of environmental defenders uh, needs to be part of the equation to be able to really drive the kind of change on a mass scale that needs to happen here in the region. Thank you so much. So another term, rule and rule of law, law and also human rights, environmental protections. Yep. You, right? Who? <laughs> Oh my God, no pressure at all then. <laughs> um, hi again, um, uh, oh and new friends, I'm Sen, I'm a journalist and Summit uh, Media Fellow. Uh, yeah, I, I'll stand up. Um, I know Rajesh was aiming at me when he was calling out a journalist, so I might as well just do it, otherwise he'd scold me later. Um, something that I might have missed or maybe hasn't been brought up yet, but I would uh, love to tease out some different angles when it comes to the topic of today, solution for climate um, resilience. I did, a degree, I did a degree in migration studies, and one of the things that we focus on in our program was left behind communities. Now the Mekong Delta is the region with the biggest out migration rate in the entire country. And so uh, what I see that is missing in projects in the Mekong Delta, and please correct me if it's also missing in other Mekong country, is mental health initiatives for left behind communities. This is something that often overlooked because of the economic values of migrants going to um, economic zone in Ho Chi Minh City and Bing Zhuang that have managed the, the phones, the very phones that you guys are using, because that is that overweight the emotional and the you know the the impact on the childhood of the of children are left behind but it's but it's leaving a, a big hole in the community and that very same community that allow these people to move away that connections are warning out because they don't spend a lot of time with their families and you know family connection is everything and I, I, I would love to see more in mental health initiative not as a byproduct of an empowerment program, but it's the goal of the program. So um, that's something I would like to see more. And in my reporting, I've also seen the power of local beliefs and religious institutions uh, in connection with um, environmental problems. One of that 
uh, knowledge came with an, a trip with Samanet team to Nong Khai, um, to, uh, your, your hometown, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and I, I, I witnessed this amazing model where a fish conservation program was attached to the back of a temple. And so there was a clear and circle zone where fish are, are, you cannot touch them. They are completely protected. And if you do, then, you know, the Buddhist temple of exact problem on you, blah, blah, blah. You're not supposed to do those is a, is a no thing. Uh, and so you use that religious belief that people have to empower them to do the right thing when it comes to certain endangered fish species. Um, and another example is in Chaving province in the Mekong Delta. Um, I, I did a documentary uh, for CNN about coconut nectar as a solution to saltwater intrusion. I didn't mention this in the film, but the woman, the Khmer woman who came up with this idea to extract the coconut nectar instead of just focusing on the fruit, she realized that the knowledge to enhance and amplify the coconut nectar actually lie inside the Khmer temples where the monks have been growing this tree for centuries that actually the leaves ferment very well with the coconut nectar itself and help preserve it. And they also hold this reservoir of knowledge of how the Khmer community have been using coconut nectar on and off. So what, what I mean to say is, yes, the core of every project is to understand the community, but it also come with understanding something that beyond what you can see, that is mental health and the local beliefs. So something to take away. Thank you. Oh, I really like by all cultural aspects of climate change and environment management and policy. So climate change has like multi-dimensional, you know, components, not only physical, but also cultural belief. I like it. Excellent point to take away. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Lajes, what is next? So we're going to end with some art and creativity, as our colleague asked. Over to you, Des. Thank you. So in a minute. I'm just given a few seconds to just go through some three to five messages from each breakout group. So these were done live and rushed, so we'll definitely refine it after this. But some key messages from Nature-Based Solutions. There is no one-size-fits-all design. It's important to have Nature-Based Solutions that's contextual, relevant, appropriate. Co-creation is crucial, and it's important to scale up, scale down, scale deep, and scale out. And for the next one, on just green energy solutions, it's important that holistic planning is crucial. And uh, considering the cost of inaction, combining the right economic package, responding to local needs and conditions, incentivizing services to vulnerable communities. And for the next one, on transboundary risks, uh, adaptation is not always neutral. It can have cross-border effects. And most NAPs are defined independently. So how do we get out of that siloed thinking as well? And it's important to have people-to-people -people cooperation. And the metaphor of ASEAN is a cow. Maybe it's not a horse or a tiger. I just needed to draw that cow. <laughs> and over to the last one on financing. Uh, it's important to have partnerships for finance mobilization. The private sector should support the energy transition. It's important to invest in circular economy and biodiversity finance. The, there are limited bankable projects, so how do we uh, provide more technical assistance to make it more bankable? Uh, the ASEAN sustainability bonds are growing, and it's also important to look at small-scale initiatives Smallest big, smallest beautiful. This was mentioned a lot today. And I hope that these ideas are the threads that bring us all together on this gathering. Thank you, everyone, for letting us draw the big picture with all of you. Thank you, Des. A big hand for Des and Tofu Creatives. They've been with us the last two days drawing from the sessions. So I end now the session with big thanks to my co-moderator, Achan Kanakwan, and thank you to the audience. Over to you. Thank you, everyone. Um, those drawings are so cool. <laughs>
just a cool aside. So we have two final speakers for the night. Uh, first, I would like to invite Mr. Shane McKenna, the first Secretary of Development of the Australian Embassy in Thailand, for his closing remarks. Thank you very much. Is this on? Can you hear me? Oh, yes, that's better. Thank you very much. Um, I want to just start by, by basically thanking everybody here today. Um, it's been a fantastic, well, it's been a big two weeks, actually, um, and a, a very big couple of days for SEI and for all the participants here discussing uh, the climate issues, water management, and the whole range of other, other really important cross-cutting uh, themes that, that fit under the climate theme. Um, it strikes me that the last two weeks actually have involved a lot of different stakeholders in a lot of different uh, fora. Uh, we've had business missions looking at green economy. We've had the Thailand Climate Conference and uh, Ex Sustainability Expo, uh, which brings particular stakeholders together. We've had yesterday's uh, very, very interesting discussions on, on how we approach the, the issues of climate change, water management, and other things as researchers and analysts. Um, and then we have had today's climate workshop, which has brought all you experts together to, to have these conversations. Um, uh, so it's been a, a busy time, but I think it's been a very, very fruitful time. And I just wanted to, to start off by thanking everybody uh, and a heartfelt thanks to participate in, um, I'm assuming, multiple different uh, venues, taking up a lot of your time and to contribute so actively uh, to today and for those who attended yesterday. So it is greatly appreciated. I also want to thank Trila Longhorn University and SEI for hosting this event. Um, it's taken a lot of work. Uh, well, in fact, it's a week, isn't it? Uh, so for a, a week's worth of events. Um, so thank you very much. Um, it is very much appreciated. And I know it's the second time we've done this, and I do hope that uh, we will have an opportunity for a third. Before going on, I also just want to congratulate SEI Asia on the 20th anniversary of their work here in Asia. It's highly valued work. It's had a, a, tr a tremendous impact, which I just have to look around the room to see the impact that you're having with the number of people and networks that you've brought together in one place. I've actually just put aside my well-prepared remarks. Uh, I'm sorry to those who prepared them, um, because I wanted to actually do something a bit different. I was going to, to talk about the uh, you know, Australian commitment to, to the region. Um, I was going to say, you know, that you, you know we support the partnerships, uh, the locally-led development, um, and also, importantly, that our commitment to the region uh, is, is continuing with the recently announced Meeking Australia Partnership second phase uh, over the next five years. But that information has already been uh, uh, informed to you this morning. I also was going to frame this, this, this um, closing by reflecting on some of the climate problems that the region's in, in, in experiencing right now. Uh, the, the tremendous flooding, the, the awful situation that's across so many countries to the north, uh, from Vietnam to Laos to Thailand. Um, but I, I do want to just mention that and pause to acknowledge the, the impact on individuals at this point in time whilst we sit here and talk about the impact of climate. Um, whether it's the impact of the climate change on these weather events, um, I'm sure there's various views on, on, on how much of an impact that has had, but regardless, I think it does have an impact, um, and uh, we should just pause and, and think of the real, the real personal impacts to families, yeah. livelihoods, um, and, uh, and just acknowledge that for just one moment. Now, I've turfed my, my original speech because I wanted to pick up on Leo's optimism this morning, because I think that is a nice way to end. The reflections we've just had raise a lot of problems, and I don't want to undermine or, or downplay all of the issues that, that exist in our day-to-day -day lives, but I think it's a good way to end on an optimistic note. Um, Leo reflected on, on the, the changes that had occurred over a period of time, and I 
and it, it is always nice to be brought up to, to not lose sight of these big impacts. Uh, it's all too easy to be caught up in the, in the detail of the issues of our particular program, whether it's an energy transition or a nature-based solution, uh, and they're very real problems. But it's always nice just to stop a moment to, to breathe and to think about the, 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 the broader change and the, and the successes that we've had. So thank you very much for this morning. It did set a, a nice framework uh, to, this, to this day. I want to reflect on a different level of success and a bit of also reasons for optimism um, based on today. The fact that we have so many alliances, academics, universities, government, um, NGOs, I don't know if there's any business, different industries, um, all present here today. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about breaking down silos. Well, this is a great start. Um, the introductions to various different players in the room just now was, was, was the start of potential conversations to break down some of those silos. We have to start somewhere, and this is as good a place as any. So thank you very much for your presence today, and I do hope that we can continue to break those silos. But it is a cause for celebration of, of what we have achieved here today. I also uh, took note of the different disciplines and different expertise in the room. It's fantastic that we can bring together the various elements that are needed to tackle the, the problems that we are all facing, because we can't do this alone, we can't do this within a single discipline. So another reason for uh, celebrating a bit of a success from events like today. I also note the what the people in the room are from uh, many countries across not only the, the Mekong subregion, the greater Mekong region, uh, but international, um, whether it's Australia, uh, where I'm from, or uh, Sweden, or um, uh, other places where expertise reside and where commitment lies to working together to solve uh, the problems that we are, are facing. This is also a reason for success, uh, to celebrate success. Um, we have increased, the conversation this morning, increased and expanded upon the usual gender, disability, and social inclusion conversation. Now, this is really important to the Australian government, uh, and particularly in what we're going to be doing over the next five years. And I think that's also another uh, reason to celebrate a success, acknowledging in a, a far more robust way um, this morning uh, the various uh, elements of, of, what, uh, of what the minorities might, uh, we need to consider, the impact of climate and water security on indigenous populations, which was a fantastic discussion uh, this morning, and the needs of indigenous communities. The need to think differently about what in fact is demanded by indigenous communities. Um, these are the discussions that I think uh, are being expanded upon and added to the debate around uh, climate solutions, uh, water security solutions, and, and related. And I think that is also a thing to celebrate. It's a success. Um, the conversation evolves. My overall impression from the morning session and from the breakout sessions, and thank you for the feedback, despite all of those day-to-day uh, -day problems that were raised in terms of, the, uh, of taking forward some of our, our, our desires, our projects, and getting the outcomes we might be looking for. To borrow from someone, and I can't remember who it was, but to borrow from the words of someone in our breakout session, it seems to me we're on the cusp. We're on the cusp of doing something really great, right? There's all of these threads that are coming together, um, cross-discipline, across uh, sector, across government, NGO, business, uh, researchers, and communities. It's just unpicking those last little things uh, to, to, to bring these, these threads into something that, that, that impacts on change. Now, I, I do realize, and I don't, as I said, I don't want to downplay these issues. Um, the, the barriers to doing that are still significant. Um, there is, it's always easy to remove the low-hanging fruit, and when you, when we get to a point of time, it becomes more and more difficult. I do acknowledge that. But I still think we should celebrate um, how far we have come. Um, and venues like today and the conference like today contribute greatly to 
to the journey. I think I'll, I won't take too much time. I will end on this note, but I just wanted to finally say that I think it would be a pity if um, the discussions today stopped. Um, and I'm sure they won't. Um, but my observation is there's a, there's a range of existing networks in the room. There's a range of new networks and a range of new partners. I would really hope that um, there's an opportunity, uh, whether it's uh, self-initiated or whether uh, someone in the room can facilitate opportunities for um, these new networks to become uh, more integrated within, um, within the work that, that we do. Uh, and that consultations and the journey that we all, we all are going through uh, becomes more shared. Um, so I guess it's a challenge. What would we do differently tomorrow that we haven't done already uh, to make a, a small, or even a large, but even a small fight, a small change to, to advance the, the climate solutions and the water security solutions, to advance the inclusive agenda that we all desire um, uh, within the sectors and in the solutions that we are working towards. So thank you very much, and once again, thank you for all the great organisation behind uh, today's event. Thank you, Mr. McKenna. Uh, I think we all will agree with the reflections of optimism that we take away from today uh, and all those conversations that have started uh, between new networks. Uh, finally, I would like to invite Mr. Mons Nielsen, the Executive Director of the Stockholm Environment Institute on stage. Yeah, yeah, thank, good. <laughs> good afternoon, good evening everyone. Pleasure to be here in front of you and giving the closing remarks. I'm the only one standing between you and a glass of wine now, so. Uh, organizers are really good at finding uh, really old pictures, and uh, as you note, this, this is a picture from when I uh, was appointed as executive director. I have an entirely new hair color now, like <laughs> Barack Obama and many other presidents. Uh, <clears throat> I have uh, with me today, as you have noticed, a couple of board members. Uh, one board member from Finland, uh, which is neighboring country to Sweden. It's a very friendly neighbor. We are best friends, I think you could say. Finland and Sweden, a little bit like uh, maybe Thailand and Lao PDR. Uh, but uh, we work together quite a lot, and we take inspiration from each other. The new president of Finland, uh, speaks Swedish, uh, and he is, uh, he has a, a wise word about speeches. You should only say three things in a speech. And I will take inspiration from that, three things. Uh, the first thing I want to say is um, that in our new strategy at SEI, we are making a little tweak to the climate area. Climate is one of our three major impact area. And it has been that for a long time. Uh, we have called it reducing climate risk. Now we will be calling it climate transitions. And this is, for me, a, actually an important tweak. Because it's more changes than we have previously understood to, uh, for example, move to a fossil-free energy system, uh, to a more resilient and adaptive society, and also transforming our governance and our financial systems, et cetera, to a more fair and inclusive uh, approach. These are major shifts, and these shifts have to occur across scales, across sectors, across borders. So, for example, we've heard today about crossing scales. We have transitions in terms of small-scale energy producing the entities on rooftop solar together with battery storage or uh, basic energy access for rural communities, all the way to uh, power sector integration in the greater Mekong region. Um, we are across sectors, from waste management to reducing emissions in agriculture to industrial uh, 
change. And we have, uh, of course, the cross-border aspect with the Mekong perspective that has really uh, um, been emphasized over these couple of days. Um, so these transitions, they are complicated. They are not easy, but we are on the way of doing them now. And this means that we want to transition to a modern, innovative, climate smart and resilient future. Uh, and, but with this actually comes new challenges. Everything you do, you create something new. And the navigation of this is where we are right now. How do we make this navigation in the face of new geopolitical uh, challenges and tensions? We're creating new supply chains. We're creating new um, vulnerabilities in these supply chains. And we are creating actually social tensions and some of the old governance systems that are still operating are amplifying problems, for example, for marginalized and poor communities. Uh, so we are seeing in many countries in Europe backlashes against the climate transition, where it's been going on for a while and now there's a popular uh, demand for, uh, or that you could say populist politics around uh, slowing down this. Uh, and this, this brings me to the third point, and my final point, is that that means that we need to have a transition in how we do uh, governance. Now, here is, of course, many different roles to fill. And in SEI, we are committed to putting science, knowledge, evidence into the core of decision-making processes. Uh, our role is this, and we want to make sure that the best available knowledge is at play and that we have, uh, we're taking always a systems perspective, not looking at the problem in isolation, but looking at the connecting parts. And thirdly, we're taking in a diversity of perspectives, disciplines, and voices from different communities to understand the, uh, the change from different facets. And this is, I think, which we will continue to do and uh, work with all the partners here. So I want to stop there. I want to thank particularly the organizing team at SEI Asia and Shula Longkorn University. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our very generous uh, main donor, the government of Australia. And I also want to mention the government of Sweden, who is funding a lot of the substance and the content and the networks that have been amplified here today. And of course, all of you guys, the fantastic partners coming from the Summernet and the MTT uh, across this wonderful region. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Nielsen. Uh, so I would just close out by also thanking everyone for sharing your knowledge, your experiences, and bringing your energy and enthusiasm today. And now uh, there are some refreshments and networking uh, in ballroom one. So have a good evening and enjoy.